God is so good. It's so amazing to have a personal relationship with God. You know, the more I walk this thing, the more I learn the intricacies of his personality and his personality as it relates to me. I wasn't going this way. I had a whole different message, but I'm going to let him lead me. And sometimes when you have a relationship with someone for years or decades, sometimes you, you, know, you hit little spots where it's a little stale. Sometimes it's, some things happen that you don't really agree with. The thing that I like about Jesus the most is if you happen to have a, a way of thinking that is slightly off-center, he will let you know in a customized way so that you can make the adjustment. If you receive it, so that you can make the adjustment and immediately go higher. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? Now, I know the congregation is a little small on this morning, which means that it's a very specific message. If you're here on this morning, it is no coincidence. He's got something very specific to your situation on this morning. Amen. I would imagine that most of you right now have been dealing with some things for a while, but very recently, in the last day or so, he gave you a very specific message Amen. for you. That the way you've been looking at some things is completely out of whack. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? Now, I don't plan on being before you long. I'm going to preach this word. I'm going to preach it to the best of my ability. I'm going to bless that he, I'm going to ask him to have me stand up in this word and have it come alive around me and on me and through me as he would use me as a trumpet for his word, for his anointing, for his power. The only thing that I want you to do is I preach this word. You simply say, I'm going to do my part, you do your part. Does that sound like a fair deal? Go with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to go into chapter 25. We're going to start with verse 20. If you need to get up and go to the bathroom, go around the outsides. As you know, we're filming for the Word Network as well as the local stations. That's the purpose of the green screen behind me so that we transpose the image. We can't, it's not that we can't match colors. It's just so we can put the, the image up here. How many people had a struggle getting here this morning, starting from last night? I know I had a struggle. I broke my tooth. They were trying to tell me I shouldn't get up and preach this morning for TV because it looked bad. You know what? Get it. <laughs> I'm going to get it fixed tomorrow morning. I'm going to preach that word today. <laughs> <laughs> Get this side. How many people had a struggle getting here? How many people had some opposition? Raise your hands high. Don't be ashamed of that. How many people realized recently that the way you've been looking at some things is not really the right way? Amen. 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 I appreciate the honest saints. Before you go to, I'm sorry, I said Genesis. What did I say, 25? Okay, before you go there, let me go here. Genesis 12, you don't have to go here. Genesis 12 and 2 reads, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the promise that God made to Abraham. The Old Testament Address God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were the three that were in line that received the promises of God. And if you can reach that level in God, if you can ascend to that place, to that monumental dimension of faith in God, you also get to partake in those promises because you are one of the heirs, spiritually speaking. So basically, it is your birthright if you can get there to receive these promises. Many of us have received promises for a long time. We've been waiting on some promises for a long time. Some things that God promised months and years and even decades ago to some people. 
Some of you have almost forgotten about some of the things that God has promised or at least attempted to because it seemed to take so long to truly manifest in its fullness until it's almost like you're trying to put it in the back recesses of your mind so that if it doesn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen, you won't be any further disappointed. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? And recently, in the last few weeks, maybe in the last couple of months, you can start to see the manifestation of some of the things that he's promised, and you can see that the things are getting closer and closer, and you've seen some things starting to, to come into focus. As some of the things have come more into focus, you realize that maybe one or two of those things don't look anything at all like what you thought you were going to get. Some things have changed, the pictures changed, some of the characters have changed. You've gotten yourself in a position where you're just trying to go with the flow. God, I'm just trying to roll with you and trying to trust you. And, 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 and really, my relationship with you, God, is, is evolving so that I can have more happiness and joy in my life. And maybe I need to seek that happiness and joy from, from different ways than I thought I would while I'm serving you, God. How many people know what I'm talking about? It didn't show up. It didn't show up the way some of us thought that it would. And even in showing up, it seems like some of the things, or one of the things may be in conflict. But the true reality is that the conflict isn't outside of you. Conflict is inside you. The story of Jacob and Esau is what I'm going to address on this morning. Go with me, as I said, to Genesis 25 and verse 20. And the word reads, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife. She was the daughter of Bethuel and the Syrian of Pandan and Aram and the sister of Laban, the Syrian. I'm trying to say that three times fast. <laughs> now, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. She was barren. Now, this was Isaac directly in line with the promise of Abraham. His wife that he received was barren. He prayed that she would not be barren at the age of 40 years old. God blessed her. But she did not conceive until he was 60 years old. So for some 20 years, the wife that was his promise, because he was an heir to the promise, that was one of the dimensions of the promise, was barren for 20 years. Some of us have been feeling like our promise or the vessel that we considered the promise or the thing that we showed up as the manifestation of the promise or the thing that was supposed to bear fruit as the promise has been barren for years or even decades. And even though we prayed about that thing and got confirmation from God, and he said he was going to bless it, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. I would imagine for him, being Isaac, 20 years is a long time. It might have been some point where he thought, well, you know what, maybe I misheard God, or maybe I didn't understand what he said, or maybe it's not right now, or maybe it'll be like Abraham, and i got to wait until I'm 99 years old. By that time, I might not even really care as much. Huh. You know, you get a little older, you start looking at stuff different. The things you really thought that you just had to have. Start to change it. That's where he was. But imagine where she was. You see, she was the vessel for the promise. 
For Isaac, it might have been a little bit easier because he was in line with the promise. He knew the history with his father and his grandfather. He knew that the wives of his father and his grandfather also went through a period of barrenness. So wait a minute, God. What you're saying is that part of being in the promise and being in line for the lineage of the promise and the promises of the promise is really I have to go through this period of barrenness. A period of faith, a period of trusting you no matter what, a period of wondering if it's ever going to happen, a period of understanding that even if it doesn't happen, I'm still going to serve you, a period of wanting to let go of really completely serving you because it's not serving me. Oh, my God, I didn't mean to. I should have warned you before I threw that jab. <laughs> it's not always easy. And sometimes when, you, when, you, when you've been at one level for a while and you're trying to get to the next level, y'all stay with me. When you're trying to get to the next level, sometimes the spiritual warfare, the biggest fight is not on the outside, but it's on the inside of who you are. God, I want to serve you. I want to keep on moving. But it looks like this dimension is leaving me. And the way I thought I was going to get it, I might not get it. So maybe I need to go back and get some of what I thought I left behind. Amen. And even if I don't go all the way back, I, I just go back a little bit. I just go on the fringes a little bit because I, I'm missing this piece. And, and I'm getting a little older. You know what I mean? I might, I might be turning 30 next year or 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever the milestone is. And I might miss that piece. And let me just go back and savor it just for a moment, God. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? And then you rationalize a little bit. And then I'm not going all the way back. And then you let me go back here. And maybe I can kind of just savor it just a little bit. And, and I'm still serving you. And I'm waiting for you to do this thing. Let me go a little further in the word, because y'all not really, y'all preaching it better than y'all are saying amen. I'm not, y'all not really holding up your end of the bargain. Let me go a little deeper. God pleaded with him, and, and she was bad because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. God granted his plea. He heard his cry, and he granted his plea. God, please bless this area in my life. I need, you to, I need you to move in this area. I need you to bless my business, God. Or I need you to bless my family or bless my house or bless my, my job or my car or my mother or my father or my kids. Something. Guarantee it's in one of those categories. Or something to do with one of those categories. It can't be but four or five different categories, right? He probably, he know what, you, what you're going to pray before you pray. I need you to bless this area. She conceived. She conceived. And whatever you prayed about for the vessel, for your promise, it conceived. The promise was imparted in that thing. Or maybe you were the vessel for the promise. The promise has been imparted in here. You're pregnant with the promise in your belly, and you've been pregnant for a long time. She conceived. Look at your neighbor and say, she conceived. But the children struggled together within her. So she was pregnant with this promise in her belly, and it was, it was two different ones going at the same time. And while she was carrying the baby, they were fighting with each other. I remember my mother told me, I was the firstborn, my mother told me, she said when she was pregnant with me, it was, it was, uh, she knew it was going to be a boy. She knew I was going to have a, a strong personality by the way she was carrying. She could feel me moving around. And so my sister came next, and she said, you know, I knew either it was going to be a girl or she was going to be a sissy. <laughs> and what she said, she said it was a whole different type of pregnancy. This woman had both at the same time. They were struggling with each other inside the womb. They were fighting with each other. She waited 20 years to conceive, and then it was a, a fight, a war on the inside of her. Amen. 
A war. The promise was finally conceived and, and going through the process of being birthed, but there's been a war on the inside. And most of you right now, you, you're waiting for the promise to be born after so long of being barren, and it's finally, finally been conceived. And the closer you get to the birthing of that thing, the more it feels like it's a war inside of you. How many people know what I'm talking about? That's how she felt. That's what she was dealing with. So she, she, she went to God. She didn't even go to her husband. She went to God and said, well, God, if everything is okay, why does it feel like this? I love that part. She went to God sincerely. No fronting, no fuss, no muss, no trying to fake it, no being super church. She went to God by herself. She wanted to understand. And it was a time, thousands of years ago, before modern medicine, she probably, you know, after waiting so long for the conception of the promise, she wanted to make sure that, that it wasn't some sort of mutant, uh, uh, probably didn't even have that word, but, but something crazy going on to where it would injure the baby or the baby. She said, Remember, I hadn't even known it was twins. She probably didn't. They wouldn't have no way of knowing that. God, if it's all well, if everything is what you said it is and what it's going to be, why? Why is there so much war going on inside of me? And he heard her. And he said to her, there's two nations in your belly, two nations in your womb, and the two peoples shall be separated by your body. One will be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. That's profound, especially at this time in history. Because if you were the eldest, if you were the firstborn, you received a double portion of the inheritance. Right, right, right. And the younger children would be your, what, your, your servant. They would, be, they would be submissive to the authority that was given to you by your birth position. So for God to tell her that was something that was mind-boggling at that time. The word goes on to say her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, and indeed there were twins in her womb. By the time she found out there were twins, and you have to understand that, that twins were, were regarded as a, as, a, as a special blessing at this time in history. When she gave birth... The first one came out red, and, and it was hairy all over, and they, and they called his name Esau. Esau sounds very much like the Hebrew word for, for hairy. He came out full of hair, red hair. And right after Esau came out, Esau, hairy and red and, and, and wild, his brother, Came out, but he was he was reaching for the for the heel of his older twin brother, older only by a few minutes. He was reaching for his heel, and his name was Jacob. And it sounds like the I'm sorry, his name was uh, Jacob. Thank you. Which also sounded very much like the Hebrew word for heel. But not only as we would call it heel on your foot, but also Heal as far as not a really good person, a shady person, a little shyster. Mm -hmm. So you had the wild one who was hairy and red, and you had the one that was a little mild-mannered, but he was kind of slick. And these were the two brothers that came out fighting. They were fighting before they even came out of the mother's womb. And Jacob was 60 years old when they were born. And the word goes on to say the boys grew and Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. He was, he was wild. He liked to be outside with, with nature and, and wanted to be in the woods and hunting and, 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 and just only had a mind for these types of things. Whereas his brother was more reserved and stayed closer to home and 
was kind of more like a, I don't want to say a mama's boy, but he gravitated more toward the mother. He learned how to cook, and he was around the tent all the time. So he was more the mother's favorite. And Esau was the wild man. He was out in the woods, and he would go hunting and, and would bring home food and cook wild game, and his father really liked that. So one was favored by the mother, and the other was favored by the father. You see, sometimes as parents, even if we don't mean to, we will play favorites. Even if we don't think that they see, they do see. Amen. Right. The Bible says, and Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob cooked a stew. Jacob, the younger one, cooked a stew. Jacob, the slickster, cooked a stew. And Esau, the wild one, the one who had more of the wild nature, came in from the field. And I believe he probably hadn't had much success on that day of hunting because he was weary and he was, he was very hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with some of that red stew because I'm weary and, and, and I'm hungry. And Jacob said, I feed you, but you got to give me your birthright. And it kind of puts me in mind, being the eldest and having a younger sibling, especially a sister. You know, sometimes a younger sibling will kind of taunt you with something if they think they have something that you want, and they'll try to make you an outrageous deal, especially when you're young. You know, give me that last piece of bubble gum. Give me $5. <laughs> they will give you an outrageous demand to get what it is. So it's not that far outside of nature to think of it that way as far as sibling rivalry. But these were grown men, and the stakes were much higher as for what the younger one was asking for. He was asking for his birthright. And by Hebrew law, not only tradition, by Hebrew law, the eldest at that time would get a double portion of the inheritance. So basically what he was asking for was twice what he would have gotten, but not only twice of what he would have gotten, he was taking that extra portion from his eldest brother. Now his brother, because he was more... Uh, more carnal-minded. He wasn't thinking about the long-term consequences and, and what it would mean down the road. All he was thinking about that in his carnal nature, right at that moment in time, he was hungry. He wanted some of that stew, and he wanted to have it. So he said, you know what? Okay. Jacob said, swear to me. Swear to me you will give me your birthright. And at that time in history, a verbal agreement, even without a witness, was binding. Esau swore to him that he could have his birthright. And Jacob knew exactly what it meant. Many of us right now have been struggling with twins in our belly. And not just the fact that they've been conceived and you're carrying them in the womb. But it seems like they've been born inside of you. You got one that's got red hair and very hairy and wild nature. Firstborn. Your carnal nature from before. And you got one that's a little milder manner. Now the first one, because it was born first, really, by all rights, should have the birthright, but you got the one that was born after that is really trying to get in the first position. So if I switch it around and make it look like it's your natural man versus your spirit man, your natural man which has been gravitating toward that which is carnal, that which is wild, that which is, is more in the nature of your carnality, and you've got the younger one which is your spirit man that is, it was born shortly after but is still seeking to be in that first position. Amen. And the fight or the war with us right now is because some of us have been so tired of waiting for the manifestation of what God is saying in full bloom.
that he's placed us in a way to where it seems like we're so hungry and so weary in our natural state of being while we've been out hunting in our carnal frame of mind that we just want to sell our birthright for the equivalent of a bowl of stew. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? And see, in, in Esau's mind, he wanted that stew right now. And it looked so good, and it smelled so good. And he'd been out there in the woods hunting for a long time, and, and, and I know I'm supposed to get the birthright, but it doesn't mean anything right now because I've waited so long, and the only thing I can concentrate on is the fact that I'm hungry right now. How many people know what I'm talking about? And I'm sure he rationalized in his mind, you know what, if I give it to my little brother, it doesn't matter. What does it mean? If it's double, I still get half of it. It doesn't really matter. But the most important thing that I don't think he realized, it wasn't just a double portion of his father's inheritance that he was forfeiting. What he forfeited by signing over his birthright. And see, this is where some of us get tripped up. You know what, I got God, I've been walking with you so long, and even if I miss a step, it's okay, you know, because it looks this way, and I know where you've been, and, and I'm still okay right here, and, you know, even if I have to repent and look back, and maybe if I slow my roll a little bit for where I'm going with you, it's some stuff that I, I felt like I missed before, and I, I want to go back and taste some of that stew one more time. Ah, remember our deal, you're supposed to say amen when I preach it. Amen. You see, I'm getting a little old. I might not ever get to taste that stew anymore. You know what I mean? There's some, there's some things that I thought you were going to show up, God, and, and, and maybe I need to go back and get some of that myself. <laughs> Must be the only one. <laughs> I'm going to share some, you know, I've been running me a Ferrari for 20 years. 20, at least 20. It's a good, strong 18. I could have had me one, probably eight or ten times, I would say. But I would always do, you know, what the, let me do this, let me bless this, let me do that. In a minute, I ain't going to want no Ferrari. <laughs> Give me a Lincoln. <laughs> and some other stuff that, you know what, the older I get, maybe, maybe I don't, maybe I need to go back and sample some of that stew while I still got a taste for stew. We might get to the point where I can't put no salt on my stew. <laughs> so I must be the only one. Amen. 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 So the Esau in me, the red-haired, hairy, wild one, still looking at that stew. Been getting a lot of stew passing by lately. <laughs> All kind of stew. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, stop smelling roses, stop smelling stew sometime. Yeah, you understand. <laughs> I ain't know you can make stew so many different ways. <laughs> Beef stew, turkey stew, pork stew, vegetarian stew, stew with tofu, <laughs> stew just for you, however you like stew. <laughs> Think about that thing sometime. You know what? Just a little stew. Ain't had to eat a long time. Long time. I'm hungry, God. Been out in the woods. Woods. Sending them for wilderness. I've been in the wilderness for a long time, God. I got my little brother Jacob trying to hit me some, hit me off with some of that stew. I take some of that stew. What am I getting? Even if I get half, I still got a lot more than what I got right now. And that's down the road. I want some stew. Uh -huh. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? Mm -mm. You see, the enemy will come and deceive you. And usually, if he's flashing something at you that looks so good because he's going to, he's the master of the takeaway. He's, the enemy is the master of making you think that you can have something that you don't already have, but he doesn't own anything. God owns everything, so how can he offer you something that's not really his to offer? Amen. So if you're seeing something and you know it's 
more on the side of the carnal nature and it's outside of the will of God and it seems tempting. You need to be very careful because it's not exactly as it seems. How many people know what I'm talking about on this morning? If I reach in my pocket right now and give you, give me, give you my car keys. I say, how much money you got in your pocket? Anybody got $20? See, you took too long. I gave you my car right there. <laughs> I tossed you my car key for $20. You'd have jumped all over it, right? If I was real. <laughs> That's probably the equivalent to what the enemy has been trying to show you recently. Amen. Amen. Because it wasn't just a double portion of his father's inheritance that he was forfeiting. More importantly, as the firstborn, he had a birthright to the double portion, but he also inherited from Isaac, his father, the privilege of being in everlasting covenant with God. His divine favor his divine blessings, his divine healing nature, his divine power to speak miracles, divine relationship and fellowship with God. And I don't know where everybody is in your journey, your walk, your relationship with God, but I can tell you five minutes with God. Even if you ain't talked to him for real in weeks, months, you get before him in five minutes, one touch one impartation from his magnificent presence will not only change your whole situation, it can elevate you permanently to a place of peace and joy and harmony and happiness far beyond what you could ever imagine. Amen. Because with each impartation, with each visit, he must reveal more of his miraculous nature. So the more you get of him, the more you can receive. But the more you receive, the more you want of him. As long as you allow your spirit man to continue to ascend. But at each ascension, at each dimension of elevation, there's also going to be something on the inside of you that's warring against your spirit man. It's your carnal man. So it's always going to be a Jacob against an Esau because the Esau has to be there so you can overcome it to go higher in God with your Jacob. So I know right now it seems like that bowl of stew looks real good. But I dare say if you just wait, just wait, just wait and continue to seek him. You don't have to worry about that stew. He says he will prepare a table, a feast in the presence of your enemy. You can have every meal, every delicacy you want. And that's just one dimension. Why would you sell your birthright? Not just the double portion, not just the money, because most of you have been through the place where the miraculous, you know he's, he's, he's going to provide for you. Even if it gets a little rough, you know he's going to do something. Yeah. So it's almost like, well, you know what? If I, if I gave up some of this over here, I'd get it back. He'll keep me. Even if it's rough, I want some of that stew. Don't sell the stew. Don't sell it for the stew. Don't sell it for the stew. That's like eating a bowl of cereal before Thanksgiving dinner. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. I believe that Esau was having a conversation with himself, rationalizing, should I get this stew? Should I get this stew or should I just, you know, hold off for my birthright? Some of you got stew showing up. It might not show up like a bowl of stew. It's going to show up. See, you, your weakness might not be stew. I wish you could see some of your faces. <laughs> see, see my, my weakness wasn't stew. I fast all the time. I, you know, I like food, but I, that, wasn't my, that, wasn't my, that wasn't my weakness. That's not how the enemy is going to come after me. And I doubt that that's how he's coming after you. Jacob, Esau, was talking to himself while Jacob was 
Come on, man, give me that, give me that birthright. You know you want this stew. Come on, man, give me that birthright. Give me your hand. He probably put his hand on. Shake my hand on. I'm gonna give you some of this stew. I got it right here. Shake my hand. Give me, give me your word. Give me your word. And Esau was hungry. He was thinking about that thing. He was thinking about it. I'm surprised he agreed to that. He should have just went old school. Just took <laughs> my memory. He gave him his word, but after he talked to himself, and he said, Esau says, look, look, I'm, I'm about to die here. Verse 32 says, I'm about to die. What does the birthright mean to me? That's what it said. Look, I'm about to die. Yeah. Y'all feeling that, ain't you? You felt it recently. I felt it myself. Yeah, you're about to die. A piece of your carnality is about to die. And your mind will be tricked into the fact that you will not get that piece anymore. Oh, my God, I'm missing that piece. Oh, my God, the window is closing. Oh, my God, I might not ever get any stew again, whatever your stew is. It might be some old school stew that showed up. Uh, you ain't seen Rufus in 20 years. Poof. He popped up buff. He wasn't even buff when you saw him, right? When you used to know him. Got his hair cut low or growing out, whatever you like, just the way you like it. <laughs> smelling good. He used to be a little musty. He was smelling good. Got some money now. He was always broke. He just, just the way you like it. Oh, flip it. It might be his sister, Ruth Ann. And she's showing up and she got, you, she got it just the way. Just you. Ha, you know what I mean. <laughs> she couldn't even make toast. Now she's cooking five course meals. <laughs> <laughs> Had bad breath, now teeth gleaming. <laughs> she was a little musty, now she got Chanel on. <laughs> bad feet, now she got pedicures. How many people know what I'm talking about? <laughs> or oh, whatever your thing is. And you saying to God, Thinking that you're talking to God, but not really, because you really want to talk with yourself, because you know if you take it to God, he's going to tell you what not to do. So you're not going to really tell him. You're not really going to pray about it. Even if you do, it'll be a quick prayer where you just try to, you know, almost like a reverence. Okay, God, but if you say, if you think I shouldn't go ahead and go out with Rufus, or if you think I shouldn't go with Ruth Ann, or if you don't think I should go get this money, or if you don't think I should move over here, or, 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 or buy the nightclub, or go to the nightclub, whatever it is that you're dealing with, If you don't want me to do it, God, then I need you to strike lightning right now and blow the roof off of my neighbor's house because I don't like him anyway. <laughs> ah, still there. Okay, God, I'm out. I'll holler at you not this morning at 3 a.m., but the next morning because I'm going to be out all night with Rufus or Ruth Ann. I mean, people know what I'm talking about. So you bypass God and you're having the conversation with yourself to get the approval from yourself, really your spirit man, but your spirit man knows that your carnal man, which is older and bigger and stronger, will probably talk your spirit man out of doing what he should do. So your carnal man trying to rough it off because you want that stew. But your spirit man is so much wiser. Now catch this piece. He saw the corner part of you lost the birthright because he saw one of that stew. God let you know at some point in the last two or three days that stew that you've been, you've been wanting that stew for days and weeks or something like the stew. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Amen. I don't Amen. even want you to clap. I want you to raise your hand. Everybody, I got some honest people in. Some people, some people struggling with it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, which hand should I raise? <laughs> but then God told you, because you had it rationalized. You had it worked out in your mind. Well, even if I lose something over here, I'll get it back. Even if it take me six months long, I ain't had no stew in a long time. I recognize I'll get back in that place with God, and he's kind of letting me go this far. It's not that much. I'm still on the fringes. I'm not going all the way back. Amen. But then he told you. He showed you personally. Personally. 
he snatched you up. He opened your eyes. And you couldn't even look around. You're looking around and see if anybody else saw you. Knew, you knew it was him talking to you. And he scared you. Because he made you realize what you really would be losing. And then you thought about that thing. And you realize how stupid it was. And you repented in your heart. You still haven't had a chance, most of you, to really go before him and get it totally right. But you know, you, you know you're going to. You got to. You ain't got no choice. Because he showed you what you're really losing. He showed you how stupid it was and, and how, how ridiculous it was from the way he's seeing it and, and how blessed you are to be in fellowship with him. And he was mad. He was, he was annoyed. He was, he, he was a little upset. Now, you know that if you get right and go before him, he, you know in your heart, because he put that there, but you know that you can't, you can't do what you were thinking, even if you've been kind of playing, you can't even think that way anymore. And you wonder if you pushed it too far, how far back he's going to set you. Amen. Ah, remember our deal? <laughs> What's our deal? I preach it and you say. Amen. And Jacob said to him, Swear to me, Esau. Swear to me that you're going to give me that birthright. Swear. And when he gave me this word, the way I was looking at it, it seems like it would be outside of yourself, but really, because he's so amazing. Once you have the repentance in your heart, God, I'm sorry, I didn't really know. I didn't understand. I wasn't looking at it this way. You know I love you, God. I want it to be right, and it doesn't even make any sense. You know I wouldn't do this if I had my right mind. So what he showed me was, it's not Esau is one and Jacob is the other. The two brothers are really inside of you and me. And he gave me the choice to either sell the stool, sell my birthright for the stool, or to keep my birthright as the eldest. But the mere fact that I'm even having this conversation with you about the conversation he had with me, that means that some of us, if not all of us, at least in our mind, already sold the birthright for the stew, even though we didn't realize what we were doing. But he already knew what you were going to do. So really what he did was allow you to do it by, by you selling the birthright to the firstborn, the hairy wild one. You were allowing the second one, the milder nature, the one that really wanted the birthright, which is your spirit, man. Your relationship with God now has that first position. Ha -ha. So the one that had the birthright now is the one that should have had the birthright all along. All you have to do is seek him, say, God, I'm sorry, and now allow my fellowship with you to have that first and only position. That way I can get every promise you made to me and more. So what I'm saying to you on this morning is I know that you've been tempted with the equivalent of selling it for a bowl of stew. Some of you might have given the whole thing away. Some of y'all might have thought about it. Either way, the stew was presented. Some of y'all might have been getting stew for the last 10 years. <laughs> Put the spoon down. Amen. Push the stew away. Amen. Seek God Amen. with the younger twin that's in you. Get the birthright in you so that you can get every promise and more. But the most important promise is your fellowship and your sweetness and your covenant and your relationship with him. If you stay in that place and continue to ascend, you'll get every promise that he's made you and then some. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. Come on, praise team. Get one more.